Good evening. Knife crime is increasing in all parts of Wales. Figures out today show that nearly 1,400 offences involving knives were recorded here in just 12 months. That's up more than 200 since last year. More than half the attacks were in the South Wales police area, which includes our biggest cities. The force has just been given an extra £1.2 million by the Home Office to expand its specialist knife crime team to cover both Cardiff and Swansea. The crackdown is known as Operation Scepter, and Alexandra Hartley joined one of its night patrols. Black baseball hat, black t-shirt. This is a typical shift for Operation Scepter. A fellow with a knife just threatened the landlord of the Clifton pub. From knives to drugs. That's yours, is it? This is the fight against crime close up. Well, tonight we've been given special access to Operation Scepter. As you can see, I'm wearing a stab proof vest. We're going to head out with an unmarked vehicle and undercover officers, so we can't identify them, but they're happy for us to come along with our cameras to see what they do. So let's go. I'm with the team of seven dedicated officers targeting knife crime in our capital. If you just keep uh, eyes on, we're just leaving Rumley now. Right. And so what does a normal night look like for you, if, that, if there is such a thing as a normal night? Uh, well, they generally start the same, innit? We'll just go out and start our patrols. We, we just go out and just see what we can find on the streets. The age range is sort of getting lower, really, because they, um, I suppose they're exposed to it from a young age. So what sort of ages are we talking? Well, early teens, they start really, some, some even younger, I'm sure. Within a year, the team has carried out around 800 stop searches, which they say are working. Within minutes... Excuse me. ..officers pull someone yeah. over. Yeah. OK. Well, we've just stopped in the city centre. The officers had some intelligence that the car that they've pulled over has been linked to drugs in the past, so they are now searching the vehicle and they've also searched the driver. We're waiting to find out if they found anything. And they do. Around £200 in cash is in the driver's sock and a dumbbell bar in the passenger footwell. On its own, it's not an offensive weapon. When I asked him what it was for, he said he was helping a friend move house the other day and it was sort of left behind. I can't disprove that. I can't prove he's got any malicious intent with it. There we go. So let him go. Yeah, he's, he's had words of advice and he's, he's uh, on his way now. The team tell me they recover three to four illegal weapons every week. And as darkness descends, we're about to witness the next one. A fellow with a knife just threatened the landlord of the Clifton pub. Exited towards Broadway, dark skinned male, black baseball cap, black t shirt. That's the pub it's happened in, the fellas come out. So we're doing area search. Horn, horn, horn. Please stop f***ing on me, mate, you f***ing. I've seen him walking across here, fits the description. PC Richard Heath is first at the scene. He's got a large kitchen knife down the back of his trousers, as I can see. He's walked towards me then with his hands behind his back, so as I got out of the car and approached him, he's then dropped it. And then just literally, you got it to take him straight away there. Just in case you've got anything else, you don't know if it's more than one knife or anything else. The blade they retrieve is around eight inches long. This time, it's a kitchen knife. I mean, the main thing is, we've got a knife off the streets and we've got somebody in custody for it. Yeah, good result. What do you on me? Despite his protests on the night, Jai Patel later pleaded guilty to possession of an offensive weapon. The knife has now been destroyed and he has been sentenced to four months in prison. Someone was carrying a knife in a pub, in a public place. Do the public need to be worried? No, there's not a huge risk to the public in general. It's just people that live these lifestyles involved in drugs and things that injure each other and themselves. There's no real danger to the uh, sort of uh, regular public. Well, we're now in the early hours of the morning. We've just got back to the station where the guys are filling out a bit of paperwork after what has been an eventful night. Altogether, uh, the team has carried out 13 stop searches. They made one arrest and they have seized an assortment of illegal drugs as well as, of course, that knife. A busy and positive night for the team, but also a reminder of the realities of knife crime on our streets. 
75 years after the invasion of Normandy by Allied troops, today would have been D plus one. It was the start of the long fight across Europe, eastwards to Berlin and ultimately victory. But one of the first villages liberated by Welsh soldiers in northern France was Amai sur Orne. Today its residents pay tribute. Well, in Amai for us tonight is Alexandra Hartley. Alex, another poignant day. Yes, James, another very moving day here. In fact, people here are just finishing a service to pay their respects to the troops, to the Welsh troops who liberated this village. Sadly, most of their, those men are no longer with us, but one veteran is still alive and you can see him behind us on the town wall. He is Tony Pengeli. He is 94 years old and he is from Cardiff. And today he spent some time with the community here who clearly love him very much. A welcome fit for a hero. Tony Pengeli means an awful lot to this school and these French children. He is the last living link to the Welsh regiment who helped liberate their village in 1944. The fact is there aren't all that number of vets around now and um, that gives me a certain distinction which I don't deserve. But uh, it really does mean I get an awful lot of attention. And it's very flattering and, uh, well, I, I, I feel in good humour about it, but I'm, I'm simply not used to getting so much attention, I must say. But there it is, when you get it, it's marvellous. Tony was just 18 when he landed in Normandy. And as one of the only soldiers to speak French, he was pictured talking to this woman from the village on the day his unit pushed out the Nazis. Ever since, he has been treasured by this community. He is an honorary citizen and even has a street named after him. It's a real privilege to have one, one man who can come and can say, I was here on June 1944. It's amazing to, to say that uh, he liberated our village. So you all gave Tony a very special welcome here today. What does he mean to you? Tony is like a family. He risked his life for us for freedom. Tony is a hero. Of course, every visit to Amaye is always tinged with some sadness for the friends and comrades who didn't make it home. Whether you survived at all was entirely a matter of luck to take this opportunity to think of those old colleagues and those who didn't survive the war and those who died since and their families. That would be the one thing I'd like everybody to think about. I love you, Tony. And it's not lost on these children that men like Tony are responsible for the freedom they enjoy today. You are always welcome in France, in our class, in our art. For parents of young children, finding baby changing facilities is something high on the priority list when venturing out. But many dads say it can be a challenge because most baby changing facilities are only available in women's toilets. It means men are often forced to find alternative and makeshift changing spaces. Alexandra Hartley has been speaking to two dads in Caerphilly who are calling for change. OK, so I need to change my daughter, not my girl, so I need a bum change. So I'm just going to go to the male toilets to see if I've got any baby changing. And they haven't. This is the story for many parents, like dad of two, Matthew from Caerphilly. There are very few places where I can take my daughters in to change their nappies, to go into any male toilets and uh, there are no baby changing facilities in the toilet, so it's more often not on a lap, or sometimes I have to take them back to the car to, uh, to change them. And it's, if I'm out with my wife and it's my turn to change, it's a case of go up there and, oh, sorry, Joanne, I've got to, uh, you're going to have to do it because there are none, none in there. So. And it kind of makes it harder, actually, because I want to I wanna take them up more often, but on the off chance that you know, they do, then I, it's difficult to change them then because I'm going to have to do it. You want to lie down? No, you haven't done it. Yeah. All right. 
Like Matthew, Tony wants to see things change. He says sometimes he's put off taking his son out at all for fears of finding no facilities. Uh, there, there have been times where I just don't take him out or we don't go out for the day because I don't want to deal with the faff of having to change him, especially when it's a day like today where it's raining and you just want somewhere dry to change him. It, it can just be a bit, uh, well, yeah, awkward and embarrassing. And of course, there are businesses that are going out of their way to support parents, like the old library community cafe in Caffili. There you go, one cappuccino. We have changing facilities in both toilets, suitable for male or females to use. We even have a baby toilet for toddlers. <laughs> because we want to include everyone within our community, so everyone can come in, men, dads with their babies, mums with their babies. Dads have their babies just as much as mums have their babies these days. It's not just a mum thing anymore. The woman has got the role to change the nappies and this, this you know, it should be equal really. You know, it's, uh, I'm just as much a parent as, as my wife is, so I, I, want to, I want to be able to change my daughters uh, if they need changing, so it's just a bit unfair. If we can get to a position where, where there's either changing areas in men's toilets or a family area that both men and women can use, then, then that's, that, that's ideal, I guess. Um, and, and really what we should be striving for. And Matthew and Tony hope starting this simple conversation will create an opportunity for serious change so all parents can be equal. And uh, Alex is with me now. Alex, uh, you've got a, a changing table there and baby David. I mean, looking at it, it shouldn't be difficult for businesses to install something like this. You're absolutely right. Yes, baby David is here. We've named him after our producer, but it's not about him yet. Like you say, it's about this changing unit. And uh, as you can see, I picked one up today. It was relatively cheap. I got it from Ikea, £25 and then an extra £5 for the changing mat on top. It was easy to set up, have to admit. I had a bit of help setting it up earlier. Um, as you can see, my helpers uh, did a good job. It took them around half an hour to put it together. Uh, but the point is, it is quite small. Um, it will easily fit in a male or female toilet. Uh, and if space really is an issue, then you can get a fold down table. They cost a little bit more, around 100 pounds. And we've had a huge response from our viewers today. What have they been saying? Give us a flavor. Uh, yeah, a huge response. Clearly this is an issue. Parents want to see change and lots of people have been sharing their stories with us. Uh, we heard from Christian Lee Wilkes. He's a single dad uh, and he says when his son was younger, if there was no baby changing facility, I would be struggling to change him either on the sink counter or on my lap in the toilet cubicle. He goes on to say, I don't think people realise that fathers are as hands on these days. There is a higher number of single fathers who need these facilities to be available to them. On Twitter, David Evans says it's definitely a problem. I have in the past used the ladies' toilets if nothing else is available. And mum, Karis Jones, says it's always an issue if my husband takes our girls somewhere without me. I don't think it's appropriate in any way to take them into the gents. And he says he always gets dirty looks if he takes them into a disabled loo. What is a dad to do? Well, it's a good question. I mean, what can be done? Well, it really is down to the discretion of businesses if they want to put them in or not. Interestingly, in New York, which we know is a very progressive city, they've implemented new legislation, uh, which means that all new buildings and businesses have to put changing facilities in both female and male toilets uh, from January. So perhaps in the future, that's something we could see here in Wales. OK, Alex uh, and baby Davy, thanks very much indeed.